Welcome everyone. I'm Ken Vincent, the host for tonight's webinar topic, Personal Taxes, Organizing and Making Adjustments. Couldn't think of a catchier title, so we'll have to go with that one. The idea, though, is very important. Many times we as coaches run into people who are terrified of their tax situation. They really just are deer in the headlights. And as a result, they really can't take control. They're, they're unsure of what their status is, or worse, they're behind, they're filing late, they're owing money, they've got liens, all kinds of bad things are happening. That can really impede a couple or a person's progress, their traction, we call it, as they try to move through the baby steps and get control. So I'm going to show you a few basic techniques and give you some ideas on how you can move from the back of your financial bus up front and actually grab the steering wheel. Let's see what we can do. First of all, let's start with a thought about 2013. It's not too late to still do some things, even though it's late in December. We're going to take a look at a simple three-point checklist for 2013's tax year. Get organized, maximize your pre-tax opportunities, and estimate your tax situation. Now, I don't want anybody to freak out. First of all, we're not going to try to make you into a tax expert. We're going to do a few basic things. The arithmetic's no big deal. It's sixth grade arithmetic. And I'm going to go nice and slow so that you can follow along, take notes, and there will be plenty of time to answer questions at the end. As you see at the bottom of the slide, if you have a question, uh, send it to support at mymoneywellness.com. Greg Pear will be gathering those up and we'll be reviewing them and answering them at the end. So let's go through this three-point thing and we'll talk about each bullet at its time. Get organized simply means round up the information that you have or can collect now that we're near the end of the year. You don't have to wait for your W-2s and all that that won't show up until sometime in January or February. All you have to do is print your last pay stub of the year and you'll have all of your end of year or year to date figures that you need. Also any 1099s that show income from miscellaneous uh, sources like a part-time job or temporary work. Don't forget any forgiven debts from settled credit cards and other accounts, that's treated as income. And there are other forms of income as well. You know what yours are. Go ahead and just write all those down, gather them up, print out what you have. We'll use those in step three when we estimate our taxes. Meanwhile, you want to maximize those pre-tax benefits. You have to do these things typically before the end of the calendar year. If you have a flex spending account, remember that's use it or lose it money, so spend it on some medical procedure or device or meds uh, that you need before December 31st, otherwise that money goes back to your employer. If you're at baby step four or above, you can certainly try to max out your 401k or traditional IRA contributions if you're doing those. And if you have one of these new health savings accounts associated with a high deductible uh, health insurance plan, you can uh, fully fund that, talk to an investment advisor or broker, they can help set that up for you. These will all help us because they lower our taxable income. The next step for this year is estimate your taxes. It's always a good idea to do that as soon as you're able, uh, right around this time of the year, because you don't want to wait until April 15th to have a nasty surprise. If you're going to owe money, it's better to know now you've got time to do something about it. If you're going to get a refund, wouldn't you like to know so that you could file early, get that money, and apply it to the baby steps? So we're going to do this by learning it in two example scenarios. The first one is a couple, Mike and Robin. Let's read through their uh, particulars before we go into the actual process. So we have a dual income family, and we're going to take a look at how they would estimate their taxes right here at the end of December. The first step is to simply write down your annual income. It's called the AGI, or Adjusted Gross Income. That's all income from all sources. In this case, just their two salaries added together, $73,500. Then we subtract from that two different values. The first is called the standard deduction. Now, how do we figure that out? Well, I just went to irs.gov, 
and printed out the form 1040A for this year and there on the second page on the left hand margin is this table that shows the standard deduction for different categories and the circled one says married filing jointly 12,200. The next subtraction is called exemptions. You get one per person and on the same form the 1040A you see line 20 Six says 3,900 times the number of people on line 6D. Well, don't worry about line 6D. It just means the number of people in your household. Mike, Robin, and two kids equals four times $3,900 each, 15,600. Now, once we know those two figures, the standard deduction and the personal exemptions, we simply subtract them and we come up with taxable income. Not hard so far, right? Once we know the taxable income, we need to compute the taxes that would be due for that amount of income. Now, the taxes due are 59.63, and I'm going to show you just exactly how that's calculated when we don't yet have published tax tables because the tax forms for, for this year haven't come out yet, right? Well, there's a way to do it. The first thing to do is you go to a place like irs.gov and you look for the form 1040 ES. The ES means estimated and it's a table for calculating taxes when you're just trying to estimate them. And we're going to look here, notice there are two columns under the broad heading married taxpayers filing jointly. That's the right table for Mike and Robin and we know that their taxable income falls between those two values 17,851 and 72.5. You'll see those right here on the left. And therefore, we'll, this will be the line that we use for our calculation. Let me show you the arithmetic, how it's done. So we start down here with 45,700, uh, 45, that's their taxable income, minus what we call the base amount, 17,850. So the difference is 27,850. Why do we need that number? Well, simply because that amount of income will be taxed at the higher 15% rate. So we take that number, 27,850, multiply it by 0.15, that produces a 15%, and the value is $4,178 of tax, plus the base amount of 1785. So we add that base figure, those two numbers added together, give us 5963. There's a table like this for each filing status, and so it's just a matter of picking the right one and then plugging in the numbers based on the taxable income you have. Okay, so taxes due 5,963. So how are Robin and Mike looking in terms of their tax situation for this year? Well, they go to their tax pay stubs and they find the heading FITW, that's Federal Income Tax Withheld Year to Date because it's the last tax, or I'm sorry, the last pay stub of the year, the year-to-date value is the total year. And by adding their two together, they come up with withholding of 7,715. That's money that was taken out of their pay by their employer and sent to the IRS. Because they took out more than they needed, they're due a refund of 1,752, the difference between the, the withholding and the taxes due. Now, they might be celebrating that and thinking, woohoo, time for a new big screen TV. But we as coaches would encourage them to rather bring that money home in their paycheck every pay period. And so the adjustment we would want them to make would be to reduce their withholding by $73 per pay period. The calculation there is very simple. Take the total of the refund and divide by the number of pay periods in your year. If you get paid first and 15th, like Mike and Robin, there are 24 pay periods, so that would re, uh, produce a result of $73 per paycheck, or $146 a month. Let's have you read through this slide real quickly. This is a tax myth that many people think is true. Too often, people are advised to take a big uh, 
chunk of their paycheck and send it to the IRS because it's like saving it or something like that. But if you're following our advice and the advice at mymoneywellness.com, you know that you can manage your money and make it behave. So it's much better that you end up with it and control it. And there's absolutely no reason to send it to the IRS. As long as you're submitting what you need and what you owe, there's nothing uh, that says you need to overpay. Now let's take a look at a second example and learn to estimate Ruth Ann's taxes. Go ahead and read through her situation real quickly. Note that there are two income streams again, a regular job and a part-time job. And what's typical with part-time jobs is the employer does not do any withholding. Now, Ruth Ann has had a history of underpaying and owing money that she can't uh, pay and getting behind and making payments and basically having problems with her tax situation. And she's nervous, but this year, because she's working with a coach, she's decided to go ahead and do the estimate now and find out what her situation will be. So let's help her out. We start with, again, AGI, the two incomes added together, 31000 Standard deduction for her, because she's head of household, is $89.50. That's, again, found from the 1040A form there on the left margin. Two exemptions, herself and her child, so 3900 times two. We subtract those two figures, and her taxable income is 14250 On that, her taxes due would be 1500 Let's look at that calculation one more time to get used to those estimated tax tables. In her case, the head of household table applies, and her taxable income falls in this range. It's 14250 So, first question, how much of it is above the base amount of 12750 So we subtract her taxable from that base, and we find out it's $1,500 that's then taxed at 0.15 or 15 percent. So 225 plus the base figure of 1275, those two numbers produce her tax for the year of $1,500. Well that's fine, not too bad, except remember she only withheld 563, producing an underpayment of $937. Now if Ruth Ann had been doing it as she's done in the past and didn't find this out until April 14th or 15th. She doesn't have much time to do anything about it. And this time, she's taken the bull by the horns. She knows now, so she can round up $300, roughly 310 per month. And by mid-April, she'll have the money she needs to pay on time. And also, we would again encourage an adjustment in her withholding. In this case, she's paid every other week, to, uh, 26 times a year. So just a $36 increase in withholding would correct the problem in 2014. Now, I keep mentioning adjusting your withholding, so I think it's about time we talk about how that's done. But first, let's take a look at a myth having to do with filing extensions. The common misunderstanding is that if you file an extension, you just bought more time to pay, and that's just not true. It only applies to buying time to send in the paperwork. Now, if you want to adjust your withholding, it's a simple process. First, do the estimates as we've practiced tonight. Divide your over or under payment by the number of pay periods in one year to figure out how much you need to adjust per check or per paycheck. Then speak to either your employer or a financial officer or your uh, qualified CPA. Any of them should be able to help you. You say you want to uh, fill out a new W-4. You filled out one when you got hired. You probably thought that was the only one you had to do. But you can do one whenever you need. Tell that person how much of an adjustment you're looking to do. Increase or decrease the allowance number on the form. That's the, the number after married or single. If you filled out before married zero or married one, maybe you need to fill out married three. Then monitor the next two to four checks to see if you've achieved your goal. 
and make additional changes either after tax filing or as needed throughout the year. Here's another myth that we run into having to do with changing your withholding. Remember, when you fill out a W-4, the allowance number only affects the column on the withholding table that uh, zeroes in on the correct number for your situation. It does not mean the number of people in your household. Now, let's think about 2014. As you move through the following tax year, of course you want to file your taxes on time, and make some adjustments to your W-4 if you feel you need to, to get closer to a zero owed zero return a refund situation. You want to make adjustments if you have a new job or another income stream that appears during the year. You may also do your estimate, such as the one we've done tonight, using your mid-year pay stubs uh, take those values at the end of June and double them and you'll project your year to date or, or total year rather uh, figures and you can get a pretty good accurate measurement of your uh, tax situation that way. Also if needed you can file what are called estimated quarterly tax payments if you are under withheld or if you have another income stream. Now what's estimated quarterly tax payments? Well typically they're paid by people who are self-employed and, and have to do their own withholding and also anyone who has another form of income that isn't subject to withholding. There are four due dates throughout the year. Notice that they're not true quarters. The first one doesn't come until April but then two months later, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But those are the deadlines for each quarterly payment. And anybody can file if they just need to uh, stay on top of their tax payments rather than having a big bill once a year when they file at, uh, at April 15th. Finally, how do you file? You print Form 1040ES. It's a very simple, small form. Attach a check and away you go. Now the whole idea here is by making adjustments and knowing what your tax situation is in advance, you can be much more proactive about your tax situation. We don't want to underpay, but we certainly don't want to overpay either. The problem with the system, as most people understand it, is they just sort of hope or guess as to what their tax situation is until they file their taxes on April 15th. And unfortunately, then if there's been an error, it's too late to really do anything about it. So we encourage you to work with this information and to contact us and, and or your coach anytime you have a, a problem. But we want you to understand that there's absolutely no rule that says you can't tighten up your tax withholding and your tax monitoring so that you come closer to our objective of filing with zero balance. Now, before we wrap things up, I'm going to open it up to questions. Greg's been hopefully collecting a couple and we'll ask him to unmute now. And Greg, are there any questions from the audience tonight? Uh, Ken, one that was uh, uh, brought in simply, how do you tell the difference between, or how do you treat hobby income? And what is hobby income, you know, versus small business income? So if, if I'm a coin collector, I'm adding this part. If I'm a coin collector and I simply buy coins, or if I sell a few coins, is that technically income that I have to claim per se and then you know on the flip side what if i'm i don't know i'm crocheting sweaters and i'm selling sweaters out of my house to the tune of you know maybe making a thousand or two or three thousand dollars how do you distinguish hobby income or, or small business income and what's the defining line there sure great question um really from the irs's point of view they don't make a distinction other than that if it's a hobby typically you don't make a profit um, a hobby costs you money and it produces what good feelings right you you, you just enjoy your your time uh, a business is any activity commercial activity in which your objective is to make a profit and if that's the case then you are by definition self-employed and that money is treated as such so you would then work with your tax preparer to file what's called a schedule C or CEZ 
and uh, document your expenses as well as your income and, and basically you have a, a, t a situation where the net profit, the money that's left over after expenses, is treated as ordinary income. But a hobby is generally not profitable and therefore uh, th that money isn't reported. It's a good question. So if you've got a little bit of income, then it's, it's treated just as miscellaneous income, you know, for some small items. Right, exactly. Uh, there's, a, there's always a certain amount of what I call lawn mowing money or babysitting money that somebody might collect uh, or receive, just like gift money. And the IRS doesn't get too wrapped up about that. But people do need to pay attention to any forms of income that are reported on a government form. That money, that, that reporting does go to the IRS. And if you don't report it because you thought it was insignificant, you've got a problem. Great. Um, sometimes I know that in the past, uh, you know, I've had some, some credits when it comes to filing my taxes an earned income credit, a child care credit. What are those? How do those figure into the calculations? Oh, that's great. Uh, a, a credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of how much you owe in taxes. So you could think of it when you're doing your estimate as every dollar of credit, add that dollar to the amount that you paid in via withholding because it has that effect. Um, so calculate your taxes, look at your withholding, and then add to that withholding the, the amount of the credit. You may have to just go back to last year's tax return to get a fairly good idea of what that credit value could be. But yes, uh, earned income credit for low income uh, families, um, the tax credit allowed for uh, child care, uh, student uh, loan expenses, etc. All of those um, our credits, and those are good because they do lower our tax bite by the same number of dollars. Are those found on forms somewhere, the same place you found the forms that you were using tonight? No. Um, the credit is calculated on the basis of your records. So, for example, you would keep track of your child care expenses. The, the, the daycare may provide you with a record. They should, an account at the end of the year. But basically, you plug those numbers into your tax return on a worksheet, and it computes the, the credit for you. Um, we're going to have time for one or two more questions. Uh, if right. anyone has any right now, again, email support at mymoneywellness.com. You can also use the uh, chat feature here. Um, last question that we have right now, Ken, is you had mentioned FSA and HSA. Uh, how do those affect our taxes as far as deductions, non-deductions? You use the term use it or lose it for the FSA. Could you uh, just go over again, maybe the sure. difference from a, a tax perspective, not necessarily tonight, which one is better um, <laughs> in the long term, but maybe just from a tax perspective, how does that affect us? You bet. Um, the flex plan or flex spending plan, flexible spending account, they go by different names. Those are set up by the employer. They allow you to project how much you want taken out of your check each pay period and set aside as pre-tax money in an account that then you can draw on to pay medical expenses and it's tax free. It also reduces your taxable income because that money was basically held back from you. But because of the rules, it's, it's use it or lose it. The, the employer would take back any funds that, that you don't spend. The, um, the advantage of using it, I suppose, is that it, it does lower your taxable income by the same number of dollars, so it helps a little bit. The flexible savings account, FSA, is relatively new. It goes alongside these uh, lower premium but high deductible health plans that people are buying through Obamacare I, or on the market. I think you said FSA there. Now you're, you're talking HSA, right? I, think um, you... I beg your pardon. Right. Yeah, health savings account. Uh, I, I tangle those up all the time anyway. But yes, health savings accounts are, are basically uh, pre-tax money or deductible money that you can set into an account, let it grow, and you don't lose it if you don't spend it. It can roll over from year to year. That's the major benefit. So if I understand correctly, one is employee, uh, one is employee, or sorry, employer, employer offered, and one is set up yourself. The flex spending, if I make twenty-five thousand, I tell my employer to withhold a thousand 
a year, then my adjusted tax income before any calculations is reduced by a thousand. Meanwhile, on the health savings account, um, that has nothing to do necessarily with my employer. I go and open that on my own. Typically, I will choose a policy that has a higher deductible, um, yet what I contribute in is also a tax deduction. Is that is that did I say all that correctly in about four sentences? You did good. <laughs> well, so did you, Ken. And uh, <laughs> I think that's the end of the questions. If you want to okay. give us the big uh, the big finale here. All right. Uh, a couple more bullets here for everybody. Uh, I do appreciate your attendance and participation. It's a, it's a funny time of year to be uh, talking taxes, I realize that, and it's a scary subject for a lot of people. So kudos for those who are brave enough to uh, show up with their mug of cocoa and have a go at it. Uh, but I want to encourage you once again, don't be afraid to be proactive. Step into this, learn enough about it to eliminate some of the fear and to feel that you have a little more control. But when in doubt, ask for help. Uh, talk to a tax preparer you trust or one with a good referral or a CPA and let your coach know what you're doing and let your coach guide you through that process as well. And then we're always here at MyMoneyWellness.com to provide you with additional support or coaching or specialized help. Uh, for example, there's a three-page guide that goes along with tonight's uh, material. So if you'd like to write to support at MyMoneyWellness.com and request the tax year uh, guide. We'll certainly send that to you. We are also recording these sessions and they'll be posted on My Money Wellness and Greg can provide you with additional input as to where exactly to look for that. But if you want to listen to it again at a later time, you're welcome to. And I thank you once again for your attention tonight.